And I'm excited to see such a huge crowd interested in the subject. And I gotta say, I share your interest quite a lot because uh, today I'm actually going to be speaking about something I've been doing full time for, for many years. And the reason I decided to want to talk about this today is, as it turns out, this particular technology, this particular subject, has seen uh, explosive interest over the last couple of years. And this is mainly caused by uh, the su successful adoption uh, by uh, some early adopters causing market response and additional emerging products on the market related to AutoML. So nowadays, uh, it's not something exotic, it's not something particularly unseen, even uh, you, pick, you can pick any major cloud provider uh, nowadays and they are going to have something related to AutoML in their service offering and there are more and more new products uh, appearing nowadays in, in the area of automated machine learning. But at the same time, there's also a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about what AutoML is and what it can do and what it cannot do, what it can be used for. And to us in the tech industry, I think this is not something to be surprised of because uh, I'm sure all of you remember the emergence of big data in the beginning of this decade where everyone rushed to give their own definition of what big data was and what big data wasn't. Uh, and uh, new niche products started appearing on the market. So pretty much the same thing happens nowadays with the increased interest in automated machine learning. So having worked in this uh, area for a while, I decided to take a look on the internet and see what the internet says about what AutoML is. And the first definition I found is uh, from an academic source. This is AutoML.org, uh, which is one of the uh, most prominent research groups in academia and AutoML is from the University of Freiburg. And they define AutoML as a collection of methods and processes for making ML available for a wider audience and to accelerate research and machine learning. The other definition I found was from Wikipedia. And in contrast to the previous one, Wikipedia says that automated machine learning is only about automating the whole process end to end and uh, something to be applied specifically to real world problems. So which is it? And I got to say that just as there are many definitions, there are also many concerns and even fears about AutoML. And honestly, after a few years of talking to my peers from the data science community, I can even compile a rating of top three questions, uh, concerns and fears um, that, that I've, I've heard from people when I mentioned automated machine learning. And by far, the most popular question is, Will my job get automated away? Is it the end of the world for data scientists? Will automation take over? So should I, should I be learning some new skills? Should I, should I be changing my profession? Because automation will replace me eventually. Uh, probably the second most popular question, especially coming from more academically inclined uh, audiences, um, well, I've heard something about automated machine learning. It's when a neural network generates neural networks, right? Uh, and uh, probably the third most popular question is, well, why do why apply automation? Data, I, I spend a lot of time. Uh, I learned a lot, had to learn a lot of skills to become a data scientist. It requires serious uh, human expertise, serious like multidiscipline education. How can automation ever be better than than human expertise in this? Another variation of this question would probably be something like. Uh, in my line of work, I train deep generative audio models. Can AutoML train deep generative audio models for me? No? Then why, what's it good for if it cannot do that? That's probably another variation of this question. Um, so uh, to answer some of, these, uh, some of these questions and to give some context into the, why, why there are so many different definitions, uh, I'm going to give you the three levels of scope uh, that you can use to talk about AutoML. The first level of scope uh, is academic AutoML, when you, uh, your task is to figure out how to uh, make some fundamental building blocks of automation better. And uh, you, as an academic professional, uh, you are uh, concerned about you know pushing human knowledge to new levels. Uh, you know, get published, get cited. Maybe uh, someone will implement your ideas in a product. One level of scope higher is when you decide to take these ideas and build uh, an open source library or maybe an open product, incorporating some of these early ideas. So you're now not only uh, worried about uh, solving the problem of automated machine learning, you you also have to worry about you know. Uh, 
engineering aspects of this, building a product out of this, uh, involving early adopters, uh, making sure that people use your library, that people contribute to your library, and so on. And the third and probably highest level of scope is when you try to build a business around automated machine learning. In this case, you, you don't only care about uh, solving the problem of automation and building a product uh, that, that implements these ideas, but you also have to make sure to build a profitable business, that customers actually use your product. Uh, because if you're not solving real-world problems with a commercial product, that means customers won't buy it, investors won't invest in it, and people won't work for you because people also expect their salaries to be paid, right? So there's a lot of things you have to worry about when you're trying to make a business out of it. And this is actually uh, going to be the focus of, of today's talk, so I'm going to give you some insights from the trenches, uh, having worked in this, in this area for, for almost a, a decade as experience of, a, of building a commercial automated machine learning product around this. So a very brief background about who we are and what we are doing. Uh, uh, we've been doing this for, for about eight years now, and uh, over the course of our operations, we've built, our customers have built over a billion machine learning models for very different industries. Nowadays, we're powering some of the world's largest corporations. Um, there are a few hundred clients from very different verticals. Um, and uh, we've seen, like, throughout this whole time, we've seen how the, uh, how the customers' use cases uh, look like, what are the real-world modeling problems they're trying to solve. And over time, we've refined our vision, we've refined our product, and nowadays we're, we see that, okay, customers are happy, investors seem to be happy, market analysts like Gartner seem to be happy, so there must be something right in this vision. And I wanted to share with you today some, some bits of what our philosophy behind AutoML is and what are the particular approaches we're taking for implementing this. So just to, to, to uh, get everyone on the same page, uh, this is the fundamental uh, chart I, uh, I would like every data scientist out there in the world to keep in mind that regardless of what kind of data science project we're building, it's essentially for one of these three goals or any combination of these three goals. Any data science project we're building out there, it has to serve one of these three purposes. It, it's either about automation, so we must be doing something faster than we did before, or optimization, we must be doing something better than we did before, or actionable insights, we must provide some information that can power executive decisions and indirectly influence the bottom line. So, I encourage you to think about any data science use case you, you've seen in the past and uh, try to categorize which kind of value it delivers. I, I try to think really hard about all data science use cases I've, I've seen in, in my career, and it was all, each, at least one of these three. If you can think of a fourth category, please find me and tell me about it. That would be very interesting to hear if there are any uh, projects you've delivered that delivered uh, uh, some type of value that wasn't in these three categories. So if we uh, drill down into data science part a bit, uh, we see these all familiar steps that we need to be executing in, uh, in scope of the data science project. Note that I'm deliberately not drawing any left to right arrows because I'm sure for everyone who's worked with this, you know how nonlinear this process sometimes gets and how cyclic this process sometimes gets, but just to, as a reminder that these are the steps you absolutely need to be doing to deliver uh, the end value of, of, of your project. So you have to go all the way from problem framing to this part, which is often overlooked when describing a data science project, but is absolutely essential that your modeling has to be consumed by someone. There's got to be a person that looks at, your, at the result of your modeling and, and changes their behavior. Uh, after looking at the, uh, at the prediction or, or the software that your model is incorporating into. And if we look at uh, the typical data scientist persona, uh, they, are usually, uh, they usually have great expertise in building and tuning uh, models and uh, you know, picking features, optimizing the models, picking hyperparameters, but they sometimes uh, lack the skills or training or mentorship in some of these adjacent areas like incorporating a model into a piece of software or collecting the data from the organization and, um, and bringing it to a, a shape that's suitable for modeling. And some of these steps, a lot of data scientists, me, me included, just plain hate doing. It's like 
annotating data, collecting supervision labels for data, or when you've built the models and you work in a regulated industry, you have to spend months of, of, of your time documenting the models, um, explaining you know, some uh, compliance-related concerns, and making sure that uh, you comply with all the regulations, and so on. And if the organization is large enough, if the project is large enough, Inevitably, I've seen this all the time, that in large organizations there are different teams handling uh, different parts of the project, and what I've commonly seen is there's a lot of so-called throwing over the wall happens here. So scientists write some experimental code in notebooks that might not be necessarily production grade, and eventually they reach some result that they want to deploy, and then software engineers start looking into it, and thinking really hard about how to convert this into something that can be made uh, in, into a piece of software. So uh, there's a lot of you know, conversion happening between you know, experimental code in notebooks versus production-ready code in applications. There's also a, a large chunk of work happening in regulated industries like banking, like insurance, uh, where you cannot just simply deploy any model into production and expect it to work. You have to spend months with a separate model validation groups explaining the methodology, documenting their model, and this is something many data scientists hate doing, but this absolutely needs to be done because otherwise your model will not be legally allowed to, to run in production. You have to you know, tick all the compliance checkboxes and so on. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the current state of things. That's currently what we see in large enough projects in large enough organizations. And if you recall the earlier definitions, one definition said about something being accessible for non-machine learning experts, and the other definition said something about end-to-end -end automation. So if we look at this again, and if we uh, take a look at what the current state of research and publication uh, is, you can see that a uh, vast majority of academic machine learning research is focused around uh, the, the central two building blocks, about modeling and tuning models. If you look at, at most of the current research on automated machine learning, it pushes the edges a bit, but it still looks at the centerpiece of this, uh, of this uh, process. Whereas to actually deliver value for real-world projects, for real-world customers, you have to be doing all of these steps. So uh, AutoML tries to push the edges, uh, research on AutoML tries to push the edges, but still there's a lot of uncovered building blocks that you have to be doing, and uh, you can automate it end-to-end, -end, in fact. And uh, I, I recently found a, a really interesting uh, paper from Google I encourage everyone who's working with machine learning engineering or who's productionalizing uh, models to read this paper. It's an excellent source of insights. It's about uh, technical debt that emerges in machine learning systems, and it, it tends to agree with what I've just said, that in real-life systems, machine learning code is only a small bit in the center, but the surrounding infrastructure, the surrounding plumbing around machine learning code is vast and complex, and this is the part that generates most of the complexity for, for data projects. And therefore, automating not only this small black box, but the surrounding boxes is also paramount to, to uh, achieve value and, and get the results faster. So with that in mind, the ideal goal, I would state, is we have a business person, like a business analyst who has a lot of domain knowledge and possesses a lot of raw data but does not have training in statistics, cannot program, uh, does not know how to validate models or how to convert them into software, but they possess domain knowledge and they possess valuable data and they uh, can uh, pretty easily formulate what the problem in their domain is and uh, how can it theoretically be solved in the data. So my ideal vision of AutoML is you have a business user who knows the domain, it, uh, the user drops raw data into a, an automated machine learning system, and automated machine learning system produces an application. Not optimal hyperparameters, not best model, but automatically produces an application that already contains a, a, a model suitable for this data, and this application is able to monitor itself, upgrade itself, monitor the performance of the model, and everything is stated to the user in a, in a clear fashion. So that would be the ideal goal, I would say, for, I would state for automated machine learning. And uh, to recall the earlier questions and concerns about AutoML, this is not about eliminating the data scientists from this process, so this is not about replacing humans, this is not about automating away someone's jobs, it's mainly about freeing up the data scientists from doing this repetitive drudge work of, you know, 
rerunning notebooks all the time, changing lines of code and rerunning everything, uh, writing documentation manually, writing software manually, writing model monitoring for every use case manually. It's more about allowing the data scientists to focus on where they, what they're good at, uh, the main knowledge, the main logic, interfacing with business people, and taking automation, letting automation take care of, of the repetitive work without, you know, uh, requiring the humans to do it manually. So this is about actually combining the best of two worlds, human knowledge of the domain and uh, automation for something related to finding good models, finding good features, finding good parameters, wrapping these uh, models in software. So that, I would say, at least my and our vision of, of AutoML is that we try to empower uh, non-experts with, with uh, methodologically correct and robust tools so that we eliminate human errors uh, that occur in, in this project lifecycle. And basically the, the end value of this is that more people are, uh, are capable of doing more work with, with uh, a better quality. And when earlier we had a very busy data scientist who has executives breathing down their necks and 50 projects in their backlog and each project takes them, you know, half a year to do and deploy it into production. Now we allow the data scientists to, to complete more projects in, uh, in a shorter period of time. Uh, so that's, that's the ideal goal. And uh, I have some interesting, even some interesting stories from uh, some of our customers. So one, one particularly exciting story I can, I can uh, share is um, one of our customers is the largest investment banks in the world. And uh, we, had, we had an interesting use case where uh, this bank employed a junior analyst who had an, who in, in, in the high school dreamed of becoming a ballerina and she had an undergraduate degree in sociology. Uh, but she had an idea about building a predictive model that would highlight the uh, promising businesses to invest into when Donald, if Donald Trump were to become the president. So uh, a, business, uh, a business user had this intuition, but uh, they didn't have the training, they didn't have the you know, programming or data science skills, but they have, had a powerful automation tool. And uh, this uh, junior analyst was able to bring raw data and to build uh, predictive models for this huge investment bank, uh, telling them which businesses to invest into if, if Trump becomes a president. And the bank made a lot of money on this, and the career of this junior analyst skyrocketed as, as a result of applying this automation. So it's really about you know uh, empowering people who have business knowledge and uh, not requiring them to to you know have advanced training in all the adjacent areas, uh, technical areas, and just letting them. Uh, utilize their, their domain knowledge to their best level. And a particularly interesting use case for automation, which is practically impossible to do without automation, without AutoML, is something I've also seen in large um, enterprises. It's called model factory. So imagine you are a retailer who sells uh, hundreds of, of thousands of different products across the world. And obviously, as a re retailer, you would like to predict uh, the load on your distribution center, the demands, uh, the demand on your product. So you, you would uh, like to do some, for example, some um, large scale time series forecasting, something like this. And uh, you would like to, to make these forecasts for each individual product out of your tens of thousands of products. And it would be very impractical, very infeasible to model each product separately. So uh, you either have to settle with building some, you know, average model that that handles your products well on average, or you could use automation and build a very specific, very tailored model for for each product line individually. So instead of building one model, you know, one size fits all, you would automatically build tens of thousands of specialized models that are tailored to the patterns of of purchasing this particular product and demand for this particular product. And that's a pretty exciting use case that's, that's impossible to do without automation. You just, uh, it's not feasible to manually build tens of thousands of models. Or another interesting use case for this is something like fraud or malware detection, where uh, uh, you roll out a model that predicts fraud, and in response to your model, the fraudulent users become smarter, so your model now has to become smarter, so the users will become even more smarter. Uh, and uh, this, this is something that requires the models to have very short deployment cycle and fast refresh cycle. 
So if you have to do all this manually, and if it takes you half a year to deploy a new model, uh, you won't be able to fight fraud. But if you have automation that can uh, do a half year's worth of, of work in one day, then you are much better suited to, to these use cases that require uh, fast adaptation to, to the market. So these are mainly like the, the, the product vision points and uh, the main like value proposition of AutoML. But uh, since we are on the technology track here, I wanted to, sh to discuss some interesting scientific and engineering cases that you have to solve when you, when you start building a commercial AutoML product. And um, a lot of these uh, things that I'm going to be discussing today, they are open research questions, they can, uh, we, we cannot uh, really say that they are solved 100%, but these are the problems that, that keep emerging, and uh, this is something you need to, to, to care about if you're building uh, an automated machine learning solution. So if we look at this uh, pipeline of, of project activities again, uh, as I said earlier, ideally you'd like to automate everything end-to-end -end and uh, not require users' expertise in any of these building blocks, but uh, usually when you are a data scientist working in a particular domain, let's say telecom or, or manufacturing, you have the luxury of knowing your data, you have the luxury of looking at the results with your own eyes and ad adjusting your experiment accordingly, but imagine if you're building an AutoML solution and you have to do all, all of this blindfolded without uh, having uh, a chance to know what the data is about, what the data means, or uh, exploring any of the charts. Uh, all that you have in your disposal are statistical methods, algorithms, heuristics, and so on. And you have to still have to do this end-to-end -end and, and empower a business user to be able to use machine learning. So let's go to problem framing first. So what can AutoML do except you know, just building and tuning models. For example, AutoML can be used to detect the type of the modeling problem automatically. So uh, you can imagine that the user drops raw data into the product, and we can automatically figure out what the user wants to do, whether it's a regression problem, whether it's a classification problem, maybe it's ranking or recommendation system. So this is something that automation can also be used for, to automatically figure out what the user wants to do with the data before they, they tell you what they want to use. And, uh, but this gets comp very complex very fast. So uh, if you have uh, a raw data set and suddenly you discover that there's a date time feature in this data set, maybe they, the user doesn't want to do regression, maybe they want to do time series forecasting. And this is a very different modeling problem that requires a different experiment setup, requires different validation, requires different uh, feature engineering, model tuning. So uh, the existence of, of this very small detail can change the flow of the project quite significantly. Um, so maybe there's no target at all. Maybe the user doesn't want to do supervised learning. They don't have anything to predict. They just want to do uh, something like anomaly detection. Maybe they are looking at the log of transactions and they want to pinpoint which transaction is fraudulent. So there might not exist a target at all in the data. If there's a target, maybe we can automatically recommend what would be a suitable metric to optimize. So this is not uh, something always possible to do with automation alone because uh, sometimes your metrics are business-driven rather than math-driven. But if, uh, if you don't have any business constraints, uh, then Automation is also possible, with automation it's also possible to look at the prediction target and figure out its distribution and recommend a mathematical objective to optimize that suits this particular data well. And speaking of prior constraints, this is also something that's rarely uh, described in the literature or at conferences, but something that exists all the time in, in uh, real businesses that the businesses might have some prior constraints that you have to, to take into account uh, when you're modeling. So maybe um, regulations require uh, your features to be monotonously related to the target, so like non-increasing feature leads to non-increasing target, or maybe your predictions can only be in a certain range, let's say from one to 100 and not less, not more, and you have to uh, incorporate these constraints into your models. Or maybe you care about predicting some examples more than you care about predicting the others, which would be a weighted machine learning problem. So lots of these constraints can exist in businesses, and this is something that affects the process of searching for the best model and tuning the best model. So when it comes to data preparation and annotation, you might not necessarily have a nice tabular shaped data to play with. Uh, so a typical uh, use case that ex that's expected of an AutoML system 
uh, the user might expect to drop you know, a raw Excel spreadsheet, uh, no, no encoding at all, just raw text, raw categories, raw dates, uh, maybe like even stuff like images or audio or video, and uh, the AutoML system must also figure out what to do with this data. Uh, and uh, there might not be a single data set at all. There might be mul a collection of multiple data sets where the user might have a uh, connection to a relational database where there are 10 different tables and they are interested in predicting a particular column in one table. So this is also an interesting uh, problem for automated machine learning. Can we automatically figure out how to aggregate these data sources into one uh, master table and use modeling on this master table? And there's an interesting uh, publication, an interesting Python package for this called Feature Tools. So if you imagine a, a snowflake-shaped uh, database schema, uh, this package allows you, given the relationships between the tables, it allows you to uh, search through uh, informative uh, feature aggregations, feature interactions, and you know, automatically assemble different data tables into one master table that you can use for modeling. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, this is something also that automation can discover. So uh, many databases offer not only data, but also metadata. So you can automatically figure out which field is the foreign key to which table, or what are the not null or value constraints in particular columns. And this is something that you can also remember during data ingestion and use as, as prior information for your model. So if you know that this uh, field is a foreign key to another table, maybe you can aut aggregate this child table in some smart way, and that will end up being a very informative feature for your model. Also, uh, a pretty interesting uh, area in predictive modeling is what to do if our supervision target is not defined everywhere. So maybe our target is missing in, in some rows. So for, for some products, we know the demand. For some products, we don't know the demand, or they're just uh, too much data to label manually by hand. So this is something that, that's called weak supervision. And there's also an interesting product, uh, an interesting library for this called Snorkel. So uh, you might, uh, the way it works is basically you define a collection of heuristic labeling functions that might be inaccurate, they might be very noisy, but the combination of these, an ensemble of these noisy labeling functions can be used to build a model that automatically labels the remainder of your data. So, so the use case is like you have a lot of data, but uh, too few humans to label it by hand, so you can label only a part of the data, or you can define some heuristics that maybe if, if this data contains this pattern, maybe if this field contains this substring, that the target is one and otherwise it's zero. And these weak supervision functions are used to create a, a predictive model that predicts the label on your unlabeled data. Uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, package. I encourage you to check it out. There was also a um, Framework Days conference in Kyiv uh, a couple of weeks ago where the author of this library spoke. It was also an interesting technical talk. I encourage you to check it out. So when it comes to partitioning, uh, what automation can also do is, given the statement about the predictive model, uh, sorry, about the business problem, it can automatically recommend a way to partition the data set into you know, training, validation, test data. Uh, and this is also something that gets very complex very quickly because if you have some implicit group uh, relationships between different rows in your data, you really do not want these groups to be separated between train and validation. You have to make sure that during partitioning you keep all the groups together. And uh, same applies to date time. If, if suddenly a date, uh, date time is, is, a more, is an important dimension to your data, if you, maybe you're doing time series forecasting, or maybe if your data is susceptible to some macroeconomic or political uh, changes, uh, then you might want to validate your models in time rather than completely randomly. You know, for, for some reason, maybe because this has such a lot of coverage in the literature, many data scientists don't even think about it, but just apply random partitioning every time, which leads to all sorts of methodological errors. But uh, in fact, if, if there are implicit group relationships or if you have date time, uh, if you're doing time series forecasting, or maybe you're, you're doing not just time series forecasting, but your time series data also has seasonal patterns that you better make sure that, uh, on, you better make sure on validation that your time series model is able to, to cover the whole seasonal cycle properly. So if your data has monthly seasonality, you better make sure to test, to validate it on at least like one or two months of data and not, and not just like five days to see how well it, it can forecast different horizons. So a lot of different challenges to solve here when it comes to EDA and quality assessment. 
Uh, so we, we haven't even gotten to modeling yet, but there's, al there's already such a lot of interesting challenges to solve technically and scientifically. Uh, something automation that also has to do is automatically figure out what is the type of the column and what is the intent of the column. So uh, it sounds easy, but I encourage you to think how you would do this as an engineer if you, if, uh, without looking at the data. So you don't have the luxury of seeing the data in, in front of your eyes, but you only have you know, bytes on disk, and you only have statistical methods in your disposal. So uh, try to think for a bit how you would distinguish a numeric from an ordinal, from a categorical, from a text variable, from a date time variable, without having to look at it, only like using algorithms and using... Uh, this is also something that, that easily, easily can be uh, converted into a machine learning problem. So I've seen academic publications around, you know, predictive models trying to uh, predict what's the data type of, of a column given, given the raw data on disk. Uh, something we also have to automatically do when, uh, when ingesting the data is figure out maybe there are some features we shouldn't be adding to the model. So it's either they are uh, very noisy, so some, some reference IDs which aren't really an informative feature or maybe there's uh, a column with, with too many missing data or too many unique values to, to derive meaningful information from, or maybe the column has no signal at all, maybe it's not related to the target in any way, either directly or indirectly. Or there might be even features that are dangerous to use for the model, which, which cause leakage. So I, um, I've taught workshops on multiple conferences on this subject, so I encourage you to check the presentation in this repo. This is a very interesting problem in predictive modeling and this is something that cannot be completely automated, but uh, some methods can be used to detect the risk early. So uh, just to give you an, a quick intuition about this problem. So you might have, imagine you're, um, you're predicting the salary of, of, of an IT employee in the Ukrainian market, right? And you have some uh, data sets like, like uh, the questionnaire from developers or GUA about you know, 10,000 salaries from different uh, people in the IT industry in Ukraine. And imagine that there are two columns in this data. One is the salary you, uh, you, you predict, and the other, the other column is salary, but uh, not in dollars, but in Ukrainian currency. So if you use it as a feature, if you use salary in, in dollars to predict salary in hryvnias, this would be an amazing feature. Uh, it would be very informative. It's, it's a linear dependence between one feature and another. The models would be amazing. But the issue is you can't really use this feature when predicting a new person because the person isn't employed in the Ukrainian market yet and they don't have a salary yet. We just want to predict it. So we, don't, we cannot use the existing salary to predict the existing salary. And this is something that you uh, can see all the time in, in relational data that gets overwritten, that is not snapshotable, that you know, where new columns are derived for reporting. So you, uh, you really have to take care about cleaning out the copies of the target, cleaning out the you know, derived features from the target from the data before modeling, because otherwise this, this is going to be a feature that you cannot use in modeling. And you will build amazing models, but when you deploy these models into production, you will be very disappointed because uh, the information you had during training won't be available to you uh, at prediction time. Feature engineering, uh, a commonly overlooked thing is especially when I talk to people about automated feature engineering and how they would approach it. Uh, a commonly overlooked concept is feature engineering really needs to be model aware. So you cannot just one hot encode all the categoricals, uh, mean impute all the numerics, and expect all models to deal with it well. So uh, this is a, a nice baseline approach to take, but uh, ideally you would like your, all your feature engineering to be aware of what model is going to consume them because tree-based models, factorization machines, time series models, they benefit from very different feature engineering techniques. So your, your automated feature engineering better be aware of, of what model, what machine learning model you're going to use on top of those features and engineer features accordingly. They of course need to be data type aware. So if you have uh, text variables in your, in your data, um, and you want to apply some text modeling to this data, so you have to remember that uh, not all human languages in the world have, uh, have the concept of words. So you have to detect the language first and then, uh, and then uh, figure out what's the, uh, what's the suitable feature engineering technique to use for this kind of text. Maybe it's an uh, Asian language where there are no words, 
or maybe it's an East Western languages where there are words, uh, and you can either choose between word grams and character grams and so on. So lots of interesting challenges to, to, to solve here as well. So this is uh, an example of a, of a pipeline that that's, uh, uh, utilizes all of the ideas I, I've described. So as you can see, we're, we have a, a tree-based model here in the end, which is an extra trees classifier. And for example, a very uh, interesting techniques with numeric variables that's, that's very suitable for tree-based models is when you have uh, not too many uh, numeric features, you can automatically search for informative pairwise differences and pairwise ratios. This is a feature engineering technique that works well for, for tree-based models, but doesn't work uh, too well for, might not work too well for other uh, models. Also, uh, also um, a particularly interesting thing here that um, you, theoretically, you can feed a combination of very sparse data and very dense data into a text model and, and uh, try to model on this, but ideally you shouldn't be doing that, so uh, a more, more suitable approach for this, if you have like three text columns in the data, is to fit a dedicated model for, to, to each of the text columns and, and use stacking, use stack predictions or model as, feature, as features for your tree-based model, so not putting all the data directly into one model, but actually using auxiliary models and their stack predictions as features and doing some feature selection for, for your randomized trees and only then applying the tree-based model. So this is something that automation can, can produce. Uh, it can automatically search uh, interesting pipelines to, to fit to this particular data and use feature engineering approaches that are suitable for this pipeline alone. And uh, this is uh, something that's, that's the majority of machine learning, re AutoML research is focused on, and emerging products are, uh, are focusing on. So for modeling, uh, now that I brought this topic up, uh, you really, really, really need to build accurate models. So this, nowadays, uh, in AutoML accuracy is table stakes, everyone ex expects the model to be very accurate, and um, it, all, it often has quantifiable uh, measurements. So uh, one interesting use case we have with a large uh, chain of uh, hospitals in the U.S. called Steward Healthcare. So if you if you think that model accuracy isn't important, just look at this at these numbers. Being able to make more accurate predictions that results in average patient stay, like in the, in the reduction of average patient stay by one thousandth, is ten million dollars of savings per year. So. Your patient, on average, instead of 1,000 days, they, st they stay in your hospital for 999 days. And this one day average savings is $10 million of, of, uh, of reduced costs for, for the clinic. And uh, so with, with this in mind, every fraction of the percent uh, of the predictive accuracy in your model pays off. So uh, this is something you need to provide out of the box. And especially with business constraints, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of something that's called no free lunch theorem in machine learning. This means that, basically says that there is no single silver bullet approach that works well out of sample on no matter what data you throw at it. You always will have different model families performing uh, the best for this particular types of data. So some models are more likely to perform well than the others, that's true. Uh, especially in, in the, like tabular data, gradient boosting is something that's known to perform uh, reasonably well most of the time, but still if you incorporate monotonistic constraints, weights, uh, uh, prediction ranges, and other types of prior constraints, then eventually you will have some data where uh, you will have very unexpected models uh, performing the best. So uh, one particular um, thing I hear from, from the data science community when I explain the uh, idea of automated machine learning, a common idea I hear is, well, can't you just take scikit-learn, like import every estimator you have in scikit-learn and just have a for loop that builds, uh, that imports everything from scikit-learn and builds one model for each and just picks the best? And the answer is, it's not enough to just have this. You really need to take a dynamic approach that looks at your data and builds the building blocks of your model considering the data. Because for every predefined canned models you have, there will always be a smarter data set that your carefully pre-selected models won't be able to, to deal with. So you really have to look at the data. If you have text data, you, you have to generate specialized building blocks for text. If you have date time, you have to generate specialized building blocks for date time, and so on and so forth. Um, 
Also something that's, uh, that, that's a question for automated machine learning, should we even build models from scratch? Maybe we can reuse some previous experience to you know, uh, reuse an existing model or fine tune an existing models. Maybe we don't have to, uh, to fit a, mod, a completely new model from scratch, but reuse our previous experience of automation and uh, pick the model from, from the past experience. Um, also, yeah, of course, nowadays, Accelerated hardware, parallel CPUs, multi-thread CPUs, GPUs are also something that, that you need to be aware of when you're deploying a, an algorithm, so it, it needs to automatically uh, leverage the hardware that you have uh, on, your, on your machine. And uh, this, this last point is, is uh, easily worth its own talk or its, or its own set of white papers, so you really want the model to be reproducible, you want it to be uh, serializable and transferable because you're, you eventually would want to transfer it from a uh, training environment to a serving environment where the latency requirements are more strict and uh, you would like your model validation groups, if you work in banking or in insurance, you would like them to be able to reproduce your models uh, on their own, so you have to uh, produce reproducibility all the time. Same data with same constraints, with same parameters, should always lead to the same models, with with like every bits of precision matching uh, your previous uh, experiments. So when it comes to model tuning, probably the most extensively studied problem in uh, machine in automated research these days is automated hyperparameter optimization. So we have. Uh, dozens of hyperparameters for a model, how do we pick the best ones? Um, so instead of uh, talking about this separately, I'll just guide you to, to the book where, where it's described really, really well, like uh, all the more modern approaches in terms of math, in terms of engineering implementations. I encourage you to try these packages. They are mostly based around uh, Bayesian hyperparameter optimization, uh, which is suitable for uh, categorical, for numeric data for ordinal data, uh, it, it can be driven by past experience, that's, that's why it's the focus of uh, automated research these days. So also something that automated machine learning can do is, okay, now, now that we've built the model, maybe we can throw away some of the features, maybe we can increase the model latency, even uh, decrease the model latency even further by throwing out some of the features that uh, end up being unimportant, so maybe we can reduce the list of thousands of features to, to 50 most important ones without losing the accuracy, you know. Uh, also, uh, a well-known problem, especially if you're applying deep neural networks, is uh, probability output calibration. So models, all the models that an automatic system is building really need to be well calibrated. This means if uh, uh, you have some specific business requirement on, on the probability, you would really like uh, your model to have this smooth sigmoid shape and, and not very skewed towards some end. So you can imagine a use case like advertising. If a model predicts 10% uh, of more or more that the user will, will click on this banner, we have to take this probability into account and only then serve the banner. So if, if probability is something that's important to the business, the model better be well calibrated and not have a, a skewed uh, decision boundary shape. Uh, also, um, I mentioned these specialized uh, feature engineering pipelines for, for tree-based models or linear-based models or, or time series models. Uh, this is something that's also a subject of AutoML research these days. So uh, one of the approaches is uh, neural architecture search. This is in reference to the earlier question I, I mentioned, like neural network generating neural networks. There's actual academic research happening on, in that area. Like, can we train neural network to produce these models for us? Or uh, there might be alternative implementations rather than just deep learning. Uh, one interesting approach I've seen out there in the wild is a package called Teapot, which uh, applies an interesting approach uh, borrowed from generic, uh, genetic algorithms. So the general idea is you don't know uh, up front which, which pipeline will perform the best and which uh, feature preprocessing techniques will work the best for this model. So you try to start with the uh, with initial population, and you try to introduce mutations and crossovers between, between, between different uh, generations of your model. So you try to dynamically add more stuff to your existing pipelines and like build them from generation zero to, to generation X, um, and uh, with the hope that eventually a series of these mutations will, will uh, get you a model that's, that's very well suited to, to your particular data. Um, all right, 
risk and compliance. Uh, this is something that's also often overlooked, but something that you absolutely need to do to be able to deploy your model in in regulated environment like banking, like insurance, like healthcare. Uh, this usually enta entails a range of things. So first of all, you absolutely need to be able to explain uh, what features your model considers to be important. And this is something that has to be done regardless of what the modeling algorithm is, whether it's a neural network, whether it's a tree, whether it's a linear model, whether it's a time series model, whether it's an anomaly detection model. You have to, for some uh, countries, you have to also specify feature interactions when you're filing compliance documentations, like for uh, insurance pricing models, it's a, it is something that's, that's required of you as a modeler to, to uh, include in, in the part of your com as a part of your compliance filing. Um, also for things like ethical evaluation or you know, checking the model for discrimination, you need to support some what-if simulation. So what, what if I change the, the race of the gender or this person to, to another value, will the prediction be the same, or will the prediction deviate in a in uh, reasonable, reasonable way, or uh, something that model validation groups often change. Like, if, if I try to take this feature and introduce slight perturbations, will the model be robust enough to not skew its prediction significantly enough as a result of small perturbations? This is something that's more related to numeric stability and floating point computation, so this is more technical rather than business facing, but something that also model validators often uh, check. And all of the, if, if you have automation that builds the models, that builds feature engineering, that tunes hyperparameters, then this automation can actually generate documentation automatically. So data scientists absolutely hate sp spending months to write model documentation. So if AutoML can generate uh, compliance documents for them that they can take directly and file to the regulators, this would be a huge time and, uh, and uh, effort saving for, for a data scientist. So if AutoML builds everything before this for us, then it might as well also build the documentation for us. When it comes to software construction, uh, uh, you, all, you might expect the models that you build to be available either online or offline, so that's where the model export often comes in play. If you want to deploy it on edge devices, you really want the model to output exactly the same predictions as it, uh, as it would output in a training environment where it was built using different technology. And when it comes to technology, you absolutely have to make sure that if you deploy a model to, to production, it needs to use absolutely the same dependencies that it used for training because open source software also has bugs. It also has um, behavioral changes between versions. So uh, we've seen this all the time, I think, like over the course of developing in our ML product, we probably fixed bugs in every single popular scientific library out there, like NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, Keras. So these, uh, these libraries also have bugs, so you better make sure that uh, your dependencies match in the training environment and the serving environment. And also, um, when you're deploying enterprise software, uh, machine learning software is not, an, uh, is not uh, an exception to this rule. You also have to comply with all sorts of security audits. You have to uh, have all your open source software audited. You have to, to uh, like penetration testers trying your application. So this is uh, also a, a non-functional constraint that uh, we're seeing all the time with enterprise environments because uh, the automation you build must be compatible with the uh, hardware and software the real customers are running out there in the enterprise. So for anyone, who built the products for like Fortune 500 companies? I'm, I'm sure you uh, appreciate how difficult this process sometimes is to comply with all the IT uh, policies of the, of the customer and and have your uh, software pass all the checklists. So you, when you think about building an AutoML system from scratch, you might think about, okay, we have these old new great technologies like Docker, Kubernetes. We're going to use cloud for all this, and then you try to install this on the, on the customer's infrastructure, and they ha they have uh, old software, old hardware that's incompatible with all your great ideas and um, all the shiny things that appear nowadays in, in the technology. So you have to be more, you know, uh, creative in, in terms of how to package this software and how to deploy the software so that it's still compliant with everything. And the last, but but absolutely not least, is model maintenance. So. This is so also a topic that's surprisingly often overlooked in in the literature in the uh, in the white papers, but it's very very relevant in real life when you're deploying any kind of machine learning models into production. So um, the thing you need to take care of is 
the world changes and uh, you are almost guaranteed to eventually start seeing some data that you haven't seen during training. So if your model was trained on particular sorts of data, the world changes, maybe new policies get enacted, new economic factors become in play, and uh, eventually your model will start seeing completely new data that it hasn't seen during training. So this is something you would really want to build automation around as well. So if if the the feature the distribution of features you're seeing vary significantly from the distribution of features you were seeing during training, you need to raise an alarm to the uh, user productionalizing this model so that they can take it down, maybe retrain, maybe replace it with a more robust model. And just as the world keeps changing, it's uh, sometimes the case that we are changing the world as well. So when an institution deploys a, a machine learning model into production, uh, a case that sometimes happens is that the model changes the world under its own feet. So as the result of the existence of this model, the world changes and the model changes the data it just learned to predict. So this is something that automation can also be used to detect. It's, it's a very interesting open research question. How can we uh, detect feedback loops once we deploy the models into production? But this is something that's likely to happen when you have a large institution and you deploy a predictive model that can affect the, the, the policies from this institution and the people who are related to, to the institution. So uh, uh, if, if a product implements any or all of these features, they, they, it can call, call itself AutoML. So that's, that's pretty much the reason of why there are so many different definitions, why there are so many different products uh, claiming to, to, to do AutoML. And uh, the reason is there just in this whole process, there is so much to automate. And uh, uh, ideally, you'd like to automa automate all of this if you actually want to, to deliver value to, to, to real life users and real enterprises. So uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about this, I have two academic references about this and um, a class uh, at the data science school at UCU that my colleague talked recently. So uh, it, it uh, overlaps uh, a bit with, with the content that I described. So this is probably the only academic book that exists nowadays on AutoML. So there are some fundamental methods like neural architecture search, hyperparameter optimization, meta learning, transfer learning. This is, uh, has a bit like wider scope like, like my talk today. All right, I hope you found this interesting and I'd be happy to answer your questions if you have any. Apologies for keeping you from your lunch, uh, but, but nevertheless. <laughs> Hello, hello, my name is Alex. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, uh, one, uh, the one of the previous slides you mentioned, uh, uh, I mean, it's almost in the beginning. So, yeah. okay, uh, uh, it's about. Uh, so, you told your uh, your own vision about what is AutoML is. So, it's just uh, probably this one. Uh, yeah. So, what it should do and uh, how it should uh, actually, actually take care of itself. Uh, I have a question. Do you personally or your team? Uh, do you have something already working? I mean, uh, maybe some some experiment that works and do all these things that you mentioned. Yes, we actually do yeah. this. So, uh, like I said before, uh, you can't really claim uh, that that all of these bullets that I listed before they are solved 100% because there is always a lot of uh, like a room of uh, for improvement. Like maybe. Uh, you could be smarter about detecting data types or you could be smarter about model, model pipeline search, but this is basically the vision of, uh, of our product that we would like to empower the business user to, to just throw in raw data, describe the, uh, the business objective in the terms that are familiar to them and produce an application as an output. This is something that we are currently in fact doing and this is something that, that what the customers are currently using. Hey, nice speech. Great, great things you're doing, guys. Thank you. Uh, just interesting about some class of algorithms. Are you having any algorithms for product recommendation, uh, prediction of the uh, analytics, and so on? Okay. Um, so, uh, just to, uh, to 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 clarify something, I I really wanted to to describe like more uh, what AutoML is capable of, and AutoML is capable of uh, of uh, rec building recommendation systems as well. Uh, in terms of our product specifically, we used to do it in the past. Uh, we prioritized other features uh, 
uh, in, the, in the future. So in the past we used to do this, maybe we'll revisit this idea uh, sometime later, but yeah, uh, this is something that AutoML is capable of doing. We're currently not doing it just yet, but who knows, maybe we'll do, be doing it in the future. But this is something we've been doing uh, some time ago. Thanks. Right. Hi, I'm Eugene from Intellius. A few weeks ago, I think it was published that a new artificial intelligence approach was developed, and this approach can predict what new will be developed in the future, new technologies, for example. It's, do you know about it? Um, um, how do you think is it part of AutoML? And it's, it's just generate ideas, not mathematical algorithm, but ideas of new So a predictive approaches. model that predicts what will happen in the world, right? Yeah, yeah the right. Um, well, um, generalizing beyond the domain is, is quite an interesting challenge. Um, um, I can't be certain that this is something that will reliably work because one of the first questions is how would you validate a model like this? Like whether, yeah. So maybe this is something that, um, that's, that's possible to solve, solve to a certain extent, uh, but I think in general it's, uh, it's an open problem in AI how to generalize well to unknown domains and how to reuse the previous experience to, to new tasks. So this is something that sounds to me like the emergence of, of, of new tasks all the time and you want to predict future technology. So maybe to some extent this can be, um, this can be addressed. Um, I have some doubts about you know, solving it, quote unquote, but maybe it's something that can be used. Because uh, if we recall, um, previously, data analytics and data mining was was uh, was uh, sometimes used to uh, identify new areas in science. So, like maybe you have uh, you have computer science and you have genomics, and if you apply clustering to academic papers, you might discover that there's a clique of of new. Uh, papers that uh, aren't directly related neither to genomics, neither to computation science, but maybe it's an intersection of both. It's something that we could call computational genomics. So this is something I've seen data mining techniques used for to you know, uh, discover and name new, uh, new areas of human knowledge, whether it will be capable of predicting some uh, new, new technology, like, I don't know, what will happen 20, 30 years from now? Maybe we'll see. I'm, I'm, I, I don't feel like, like I'm, I'm knowledgeable enough in, the, in this futuristic area to be able to, to tell whether it's work or not. It's going to, that's a good question, nevertheless. All right, um, I'll be here the whole day, so feel free to find me in the, in the lobbies, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about this. Thank you.